Good morning. Welcome to another Sunday morning version of Jesus and Jeans Worship at the Cottage. We're glad to have you here. Especially if you're joining us via the internet, we're always uh, honored that you take time wherever you are to uh, be part of our service. And, uh, it's always great. My name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan, Jim and Sandra Penner, Bobby and Dawn, Chuck and Karen. Just celebrated a birthday. Awesome. We want to welcome you, especially again, if you're viewing us over the internet, we're always honored that that you take time wherever you are. We literally stream around the world, and uh, so we thank you for being with us. A couple of uh, couple great hymns here we're going to do today. Everybody ready to praise the Lord? Father and the Son, 
praise Father, Son, and Holy the news uh, right after I got home uh, last week and uh, so got to, I've got to go down tomorrow and um, uh, take care of some business down there so uh, just uh, remember them in your prayers as uh, we go through this this period uh, I want to also remember Kurt and Laura uh, Mather they're home today and uh, watching over uh, the, the internet and so I want to continue to pray for their uh, ongoing health issues uh, I want to continue to remember Christine Penner, uh, Jim's daughter out in Colorado, breathing issues there. Uh, Donna Dulac, her son Zachary, uh, has a brain tumor. They removed uh, as much as they could, and, and he's under treatment now. And uh, Ollie Crumley, our, our precious child, uh, has also has a brain tumor and cancer uh, battle. Uh, I want to continue to remember Maria Barbado, who is still struggling with uh, vertigo. Lou's 60th. Uh, Lou's 60th, Yeah, I want to pray for Lou. Uh, he's, uh, he, he just turned, uh, he just ran out of fives. And so <laughs> he's moved into that decade of sixes. And so uh, he has no more fives. So 
I want to pray for Lou. <laughs> for sure. Our good friend Susan South uh, has ongoing health issues, and uh, we love praying for her each and every week. I'm going to continue to pray for Jan. Uh, so we're still trying to figure out this uh, EPI uh, condition that she has. It's uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And uh, so she's been undergoing a bunch of tests and got some more coming this week. I want to pray for an MRI that she's going to have on Tuesday that... Uh, that will go well, and uh, so we uh, just appreciate appreciate your prayers for her. Uh, our, my good friend, uh, childhood friend, Belinda Jenkins, uh, had a tumor removed from behind her right eye. She has been in recovery, and they uh, this week had to put her back into the hospital for some treatment. And uh, so we just uh, pray uh, for God's will there. Uh, Cheryl Ori Hosky, uh, her best friend's daughter-in-law, Tori, is uh, waiting for the liver. And uh, let's see. I want to pray for uh, Linda Seabolt, that's George's aunt, and uh, lung cancer has gone to her brain, and so we just we just pray uh, for for Linda. Uh, also, George's husband Mike uh, is uh, still dealing with an infection in the bone behind his ear. Uh, I want to remember John's uh, niece uh, battling with health issues there. I uh, want to remember uh, Wayne Reed. Uh, Wayne is, is struggling with what they call long COVID. Some of you may have heard of that. And uh, he's just having some excruciating headaches and uh, uh, brain fog and, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, I, I actually have that myself. I don't have the headaches, but the brain fog, <laughs> definitely. And uh, so uh, we just pray for Wayne. Uh, got a word this morning, Julie uh, Sandman Reese. Is, hey, how's it going? Julie Sandman Reese, uh, her father, Cal, 97 years old, uh, they had to take him to the hospital this morning. Or was it yesterday? Yesterday, last night. Took him last night to the hospital, and they're trying to figure out uh, what's going on with him. His name's Cal, and uh, so we want to remember them. Also, a good friend of ours, Susan Gary, right? Her father, Henry uh, McMillan, uh, is struggling with some health issues. He has uh, uh, just some some ongoing stuff, and uh, hey, well, we're just just lifting you up there, brother. All right, amen. Oh, great to see you. And uh, so we, uh, Henry McMillan, uh, is uh, just said the only thing keeping him here is uh, the oxygen that he's on, and so. Uh, we just pray for God's will in that as well. Amen. Great to see you guys. All right, let's pray. I have a praise report. Yeah, praise uh, report. Yeah. Let's have one. Uh, my sister's uh, son's wife just had their baby girl, first one in the family, and they named her Savannah, and they live in California, so obviously Georgia is very happy. It's on their mind. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, welcome to the world, Savannah. Amen. That's awesome. We love those praise reports. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, what a joy it is to come before you and to join our hearts and our minds with you, Father, to, to not only lift up our prayer requests that we do on a weekly basis, Father, but to, to just bask in your presence and to enjoy just that that relationship that we have with you that is so special. That everywhere we look, everything we do, God, is, is filtered through uh, the majesty of your work and your hand. We love you, Lord. We pray for each one of these prayer requests and we lift them up to you and just pray your continued blessings, your continued comfort, peace, healing, protection. All of those things, Father, that uh, make walking this sod a little more tolerable. Uh, we pray, Father, for uh, uh, just everything that you're doing in us and through us and, and to us on a, on a daily and weekly basis. I never, very, ever take for granted, Father, being able to, to come and to sit with you a while and to uh, feel your presence in a very real and very personal way. I pray down that you would just reach down and give each one of us a holy hug, that, that we can feel that presence. We pray for our time together, Father. We thank you for every 
single day that you give us. We, we pray for our, our message today, as I always say, get me out of the way, Father, and let your word ring through and true to our hearts and lives. Come, Holy Spirit, change us from the inside out. Fill our hearts and lives in such a way that we might be better prepared to engage the world around us, that they may truly see Jesus in us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. We pray your blessings in the most powerful name, that of your son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 But you know, for centuries, I'd say millennia even, the prevailing scientific theory was that we earthlings, that we earthlings had a very, very special place in, in this world. That uh, on any given evening, we could a father could could put his arm or, or around his son, and and they could stand there, and the father could point to the heavens and pro proclaim, "The whole universe revolves around us." But then came a guy by the name of Nicholas Copernicus. He was known as the father of modern astronomy. He came with his maps, his drawings, his star charts, his Polish ascent and pesky theories, and he pointed a long finger toward the sun. And he said, behold, the, the center of our solar system. People denied it for over half a century. And then a, a like-minded man named Galileo came along. And Galileo, if you remember, invented the telescope. And he wrote in 1610, he said, I give infinite thanks to God who has been pleased to make me the first observer of marvelous things. And then as Galileo began to share his findings and his observations with the Catholic Church, they locked him up. They kicked him out of the church because of those marvelous things that God had allowed him to observe. What Copernicus and Galileo did for the earth, God does for humanity. Tapping the collective shoulder of mankind, he points to the Son, His Son, and proclaims, Behold, the center of it all. Why? Because it's all about Jesus. That's been the series. For the last few weeks, we've been studying the book of Colossians. And if you remember, Paul is writing this letter to the church because so many of the Christ followers were being influenced by, by many of the pagan philosophies, the pagan religions that were denigrating the supreme sovereignty of Jesus Christ. And Paul addressed these issues head on. The nature of Jesus Christ as creator and redeemer was non-negotiable with Paul. It was critical to him that his church, that this church in particular, that they knew God in his greatness and his glory. Rather than in the deficient view given by the false teachers that were proclaiming this new religion. We've studied that in Colossians 1 and 2. And the same is true for us today. You see, in the first chapter of Colossians, Paul describes Jesus as our creator, as our commander, and our connection to God the Father. In the second chapter, Paul assures us that Jesus is enough. That we can find fulfillment and completeness in Jesus. In other words, if you have Jesus, you have everything. And throughout the rest of this book, Paul sketches out what we're going to talk about today. And it's the all about Jesus life. 
What does that look like? He talks about focusing on Jesus. You know, we talked last week, he, he, Paul encouraged us to clothe ourselves in Christ. He talks about how Jesus' impact on our lives should alter the relationships that we have with our spouse, with our kids, and even our co-workers. And then finally, as Paul brings this letter to a close, he touches on three last aspects about the all about Jesus life. And so if you have your Bible or you have an app on your phone, I want to encourage you to, to turn with me to Colossians chapter 4. It's what we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to read through all the way through this last chapter in the book of Colossians. But we're going to do it uh, in segments as we, as we go along. First, Paul reminds us that the all about Jesus life is a life of prayer. There, there, there it is again. That, that word throughout the Bible. The word prayer. Why does he mention it? Because prayer is our communication with the Father. It is the Holy Spirit's communicating with us. And it's still to this day so important. I'm reminded of a, a little girl who was praying up a storm one night and she concluded saying, you know, before I finish, God, please take care of mommy. Please take care of daddy. Please take care of baby brother. And dear God, please take care of yourself. Because if anything happens to you, we're all sunk. Amen. <laughs> There's a, a great pastor and an author, a guy by the name of Haddon Robinson. And he once wrote this. He said, when our children were small, he said, we, we played a game. He said, we played a game. He said, I would take some coins and I would hold them in my fist. And they'd sit on my lap and they would, would work real hard to get my fingers open. And he said, and according to the international rules of finger opening... <laughs> He said, once the finger was open, it couldn't be closed again. And so the kids would work at it until they got all the pennies out of his hand. And then they would jump down and run away filled with glee and delight. And he said they were just kids. Just a game. And then he goes on to write just a very powerful statement. He said, you know, sometimes when we come to God, we come for the pennies in his hand. Lord, I, I need a passing grade. Help me study. Lord, I, I need a job. Lord, my, my mother is ill. My father is ill. My brother, my sister. And he says, and we reach for the pennies when God grants the request. And then we push the hand away. And he says, more important than the pennies in God's hand is the hand of God Himself. And he writes, that's what prayer is about. When you go to God in prayer, he said, the name that should come easily to your lips is Father. Another pastor, Andrew Wilson, he wrote an article about the Lord's Prayer. And he wrote that, he says, most of us pray the Lord's Prayer backwards. And he talked about, he said, a few years ago, my wife and I were on an air, uh, airplane flight to, uh, it was an Air New Zealand flight. And it felt like that it was just literally, the plane was literally falling out of the sky. It was dropping like 50 feet of just a second. And as they approached the Queenstown airport, he says, we were caught in this giant wind tunnel. And the plane was just shuddering and sporadically dropping 50 feet at a time. And he said the cabin filled with shrieking and praying. Many people were just crying out to a God in whom they did not believe. And he said just as there are no atheists in foxholes, there certainly aren't many on a buffeted flight. 
He said 30 minutes later, after having landed safely, he said the group of strangers waited at the baggage claim and looking awkwardly at each other, no doubt many of them felt silly. And he writes, he said, the content of those prayers fascinated me. And he said, I suspect it reflects the way many of us intuitively pray. Life comes first, then forgiveness, and then some physical provision. And he said, left to our own devices, we pray the Lord's Prayer backwards. And he says, without being taught, we say, help, Lord help me. And then we say, sorry, forgive me. And then please do X for me, and then do Y for everybody else. You know, whatever they, they need. <clears throat> and he says, and then something happens as we pray. We begin to appreciate more fully the one to whom we are praying. Not just the one who dispenses safety and redemption and material goods, but for his own sake. You see, Jesus taught us to pray it forward. And the topsy-turvy order of the Lord's Prayer is one reason that it is such a remarkable prayer. Jesus wanted to make sure that the disciples and even us today never forgot that prayer is not intended to move from action to relationship. Instead, it is intended to move from relationship to action. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father. And then he writes, he says, forget your formulas. And forget your intercessory cards for just a moment. And begin praying with one of the most basic words in a child's vocabulary. That you are God's child. And He is your Father. And He said again, start there. And as you start there, the rest will flow accordingly. And Paul adds to that. He says in, in Colossians 4 verse 2, he says this, Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. And Paul urges us to be devoted to prayer. The word translated devote implies an unrelent unrelenting persistence. It's the opposite of just kind of a hit and miss, you know, thank you, Lord, I woke up, you know, thank you, God, here's my list, you know, thank you, God. No, it's, it's, it, it is an intentional, intense persistence. The Amplified Version of the Bible said, translated, it says, be persistent and devoted to prayer. Another translation, God's Word translation, simply says, keep praying. In other words, don't bail. Don't give up. Be consistent and committed in your prayer life. You know, you may, you may have dry times. You may have days when you just don't know what to say. When You may experience moments where you, it feels like your prayers aren't, aren't reaching past the ceiling. But the Bible says keep at it anyway. Keep praying anyway. And Jesus likewise said in Luke eleven nine, 9, He says, And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will, will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. But remember this, again, that Paul also tells us to pray with an alert mind. Other translations say to be watchful. In other words, we need to, to be looking for opportunities and occasions to pray. 
As you look out around what's going on in the world around you, it's looking for opportunities to pray, God, what's happening here? Help me to open up my spiritual eyes so that I can see past myself and my stuff into another person's life, into another situation where you are needed. And so whether that means, you know, praying for your own needs or praying for someone else's needs or praying for the church or the community, praying for our country. Paul is saying as we become more alert to the needs around us and perceptive in our prayers, that Jesus will begin, that, that Holy Spirit power begin to transform us from being prayer wimps to being prayer warriors. And one more thing but before we move on, I want you to notice that Paul is saying to also pray with a thankful heart. Prayer is about praising God, thanking Him for all that He's done and all that He is. Have you ever noticed that just saying the word thank you lifts the spirit, doesn't it? To just have that attitude of gratitude, to be thankful. One of my great mentors, a guy by the name of Brennan Manning, and he writes, he says, I believe that the real difference in the American church is not between conservatives and liberals, fundamentalists and charismatics, nor between Republicans and Democrats. He said the real difference between is, is between the people who are aware and the people who are unaware. He says when somebody is aware of that love, that same love that the Father has for Jesus, that person is just spontaneously grateful. Cries of thankfulness become the dominant characteristic of the interior life. And the byproduct of gratitude, the byproduct of gratitude is joy. And he writes this, which I think is a very powerful statement. We're not joyful and then become grateful. It's just the opposite. We are grateful and that makes us joyful. So, you know, if you're wondering, well, where's the joy in my life? Well, how grateful are you? Pretty, pretty simple formula. You see, gratitude is a type of dialysis of sorts. It, it flushes the self-pity out of your system. In Scripture, the idea of giving thanks it's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It is a command. Time and again, the Bible issues commands like this one found in Psalm 106.1. It says, praise the Lord. That's an imperative statement. Put your name in front of it. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. More than a hundred times, either by imperative or example, the Bible commands us to be thankful. And if quantity implies gravity, God takes thanksgiving very seriously. And so first Paul says that the all about Jesus life is a life of prayer. Secondly, he says that the all about Jesus life is a life of proclamation. Here's a great story that I'm sure some of you, most of you will be familiar with. But this happened in 1886. In 1886, after the state of Georgia passed prohibition laws, a young man named John Pemberton invented a carbonated non-alcoholic beverage which he thought would appeal to Americans given the prohibition against alcohol. 
It was marketed as a soft drink, as opposed to hard liquor. And it contained a, a mixture made from cocoa beans and cola beans, which inspired the name Coca-Cola. John first started selling the soft drink in pharmacies in his hometown of Atlanta. But he had a much grander vision in his invention. He had a dream that within a hundred years that every person on the face of the earth would have tasted the soft drink he created. He didn't quite reach his goal, but I still say that he was very, very successful. Today, it's estimated that 51% of all the people living in the world today have actually tasted Coca-Cola. 72% have at least seen a can or a bottle of Coke. 97%, if they haven't seen or tasted it, have at least heard of Coca-Cola. And on the other hand, only an estimated 70 3% of the world, the world today has actually heard of Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you a whole lot fewer have actually tasted what he has to offer. You see, I, I wonder how different things might be if Christ followers were as passionate about sharing Christ as John Pemberton was about sharing Coke. If we tried as hard as we possibly could to put Bibles instead of bottles in the hands of people all over the world. But the reality is, and believe me, I know firsthand, the reality is, is that it's not always easy to share your faith. Maybe you're just not an extroverted person. Newsflash, neither am I. I. I tell Jan all the time, and I tell most people, I'm the most extroverted introvert that you will ever meet. <laughs> Being in the public eye has been, some, it's been a learned process for me from the time I was a, a small boy. But it, it doesn't come natural to me. So I, I'm the worst marketing Dude, in the, in the music industry, there is, because I just don't take myself that seriously. I like my introversion. I, you know, I remember being a, a new believer. We would go out on Tuesday night. Bobby, you'll know this. We used to go out on Tuesday night visitations. Any, anybody ever done that in the community? And I, I, I got to tell you, the idea of going door to door and talking to strangers about Jesus, who at that time I barely knew. It was so overwhelming to me that I prayed each and every time that we went to, with every knock on the door, please don't answer the door. <laughs> please don't be home. <laughs> you see, on the other hand, maybe you've been a Christ follower for some time, but you, you, don't, you just don't know what you're supposed to say or how to broach the subject. And of course, there's, there's always the fear of, of rejection, of being rejected. I mean, what if they're offended? It should be pretty easy today. You know, what, what if it turns out to end up, ends up in an argument? It might be pretty easy today. What, what if I ruin an otherwise perfectly good friendship? You see, the, the, the Christ followers in Colossae, the Colossian Christians, probably had many of the same concerns. And after urging the Colossian Christians to be devoted to prayer, then Paul asked them to pray specifically for him. Colossians 4, 3 and 4, it says, And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Paul's mind is obviously on sharing the gospel, about sharing Christ with the world. 
And as, after asking them to pray for him to have opportunities to be able to witness, he then turns it around and reminds them that sharing Jesus is everyone's responsibility. He writes in Colossians 4, 5, and 6, he says, listen to this, listen to it. He says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Now that's quite different from, you know, the guy that's standing on the street corner with a sign up there, turn or burn! He says, no, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. First, Paul says to be smart about it and make the most of every opportunity. And that, that means that we need to be on the lookout for opportunities to share Christ. This really isn't as difficult or as awkward as it, as it might sound. It's just a, a matter of sparking spiritual conversations. You know, if you, if you meet somebody who's kind of new to the neighborhood... And you tell them, you know, where to find the best restaurants, the best coffee shops. You could also add, also I know where there's a great church if you're interested. Maybe you'd like to go with me. If it's a, a friend or a co-worker, they, they ask you about, well, what are you doing this weekend? Well, you might tell them about the wedding that you're attending or the deer stand that you'll be sitting in or, you know. But he says also tell them that, you know, on Sunday we go to church. If you'd ever like to go, we'd love for you to join us. I'm reminded of an old Peanuts cartoon. Lucy says to Charlie Brown, she says, I would have made a great evangelist. And Charlie Brown answers, is that so? She said, yes. I convinced that boy in front of me at school today that my religion was better than his religion. And Charlie Brown asked, he says, well, how did you do that? And Lucy answers, I hit him over the head with my lunchbox. <laughs> you see, while it may work for Lucy, that's really not the kind of outreach that Paul had in mind. In fact, Notice that Paul says also that our, our conversations should be gracious and attractive. The older translations say that let your speech always be seasoned with pepper, with garlic, with what? With salt. With salt. Because salt enhances the flavor. It makes food appetizing. And salty speech in Paul's day, in biblical days, it referred to being witty and winsome, to have that kind of a discussion with someone else. It wasn't about hitting them over the head with the letter they just got from Paul. It was the opposite of being boring and belligerent and abrasive. And the point is, if, if, if you want to share Jesus with someone, you need to do it in a positive, pleasant way. No matter how much sense the message of Christ makes, we lose our effectiveness if we're not courteous and kind. See, I'm not after a notch on my gun. I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and say, well, I led 50 people to Jesus this weekend. No. I'm here to teach you about Jesus so that you can go out and in a, in a very positive way impact the world around you. Remember the old saying that I, I've said many times, it states, it says, people don't care about what a friend they have in Jesus until they know what a friend they have in you. So first, the all about Jesus life is a life of Prayer. Furthermore, it's a, a life of proclamation. 
Openly sharing Jesus with others. That's why I tell you, that's what Augustine said, you know, share Jesus and use words if you have to. Got to he's got to live through you. People have got to see Jesus in you. And then finally, the all about Jesus life is a, a, a life of people. Community. The very last section of this letter is, is really a, the benediction. It's, it's the part you usually skip over or you just skim over when you're reading the Bible. And Paul is, is wrapping things up and he just wants to acknowledge some people. This person sends their greetings and say hi to that person for me. But I think this last little bit of Colossians helps paint a, a powerful picture and reminder that, again, the all about Jesus life is best lived in community, in fellowship with God's people. So I want us to read, I'm going to read for you the, the remainder of this letter together. Beginning in verse 7, Paul writes this. He said, Tychicus will give you a full report about how I am getting along. He is a beloved brother and faithful helper who serves with me in the Lord's work. I am also sending Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, one of your own people. He and Tychicus will tell you everything that's happening here. Aristarchus, who is in prison with me, sends you his greetings, and so does Mark, Bar Barnabas' cousin. As you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. Jesus, the one called Justice, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jewish believers among my co-workers. They are working with me here for the kingdom of God and what a comfort they have been. Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship and a servant of Christ Jesus sends you his greetings. He always prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect, fully confident, that you are following the whole will of God. Luke, the beloved doctor, sends his greetings, and so does Demas. After you have read this letter, pass it on to the church at Laodicea, so they can read it too. And you should read the letter I wrote to them, and say to Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. Here is my greeting in my own handwriting, Paul. And then the last verse says, he says, remember my chains. May God's grace be with you. Now in these closing verses, Paul mentions nine different people by name. And each one of these people played a powerful and important role in the work of Jesus sharing Christ and in the life of Paul. Tychicus was a beloved brother, a faithful helper, Paul writes. Onesimus was a runaway slave who converted to Christ and is now a missionary delivering Paul's reports. Aristarchus Starchus was kept Paul company while he was in prison. Mark who once abandoned Paul during a mission trip, is now making up for it by carrying the gospel far and wide. A real second chance success story. Justice is one of those guys working behind the scenes. He was so humble that he changed his name from Jesus to Justice. Epaphras is a, a prayer warrior. He's constantly praying for God's people everywhere. Luke is the resident scholar. He wrote about half of the New Testament. Demas is, is really a, a sad story in the Bible. We found out in 2 Timothy that Demas eventually deserts Paul because he loved the world more than he loved the Lord. And, and truth is, I, I don't know if he ever came back to the faith. But I can guarantee you that his brother Epaphras prayed heartily that he would come back, that he would return. 
And then finally, Archippus was the local pastor in Colossae. And Paul urged him to carry out his ministry. Now, I, I realize that's a long list of people, and I don't expect you to remember all their names. I can barely pronounce them myself. But what I want you to remember, and most importantly, is that none of them could have accomplished alone what all of them accomplished together. You guys are familiar with Ripley's Believe It or Not, aren't you? Well, the Ripley's Believe It or Not highlights the story of an unusual creature. It's called the Nanomia Cara. Nanomia Cara. It is a, a type of jellyfish that lives in a huge cluster with other jellyfish. The word nano, very small. Some in the colony catch the food. Others digest the food for the rest. Others provide propulsion and still others lay eggs. They are individual organisms. Each one an individual. But they are interdependent on each other. So it is with the body of Christ. Everyone has something that they can do to help the body of Christ fulfill its mission. Just as the human body has no insignificant parts, the body of Christ has no small or unimportant members. We all have a sphere of influence. However large or small, however visible or invisible. And we all have a vital role to play in God's plan for redemption and restoring the world. You know, we, we may be as well hidden as a bone in the inner ear, as an in, in, internal organ. We may be as well hidden as a foot inside a shoe. But the reality is, every person is absolutely essential to the eternal purpose of God. God has given each one of us a mission and a ministry. And none of us can do alone what all of us can do together. Does that make sense? So as Paul brings this short letter to a, a, a close, he, he reminds the Colossians and he reminds us by extension that this all about Jesus' life is a life of prayer. It's a life of proclaiming the gospel, a life of proclamation. And it's a life of people working together in community to share the love of Jesus in your sphere of influence where God has planted you. My prayer for each one of us is that we bring, as we, we bring this series to an end, that my prayer is that you truly would make Jesus the center of your life. That when everything revolves around Jesus, our whole lives come into alignment. Our marriages, our homes, our work, our, our focus, our fight, our fashion. Remember ladies, it's clothing yourself with Christ. With mercy and grace and humility. Willing to reach out and, and touch someone else's life with the love that lives inside of you. We find total fulfillment in Jesus. And because of that, He alters the course of our lives. And so, 
If you're watching over the internet, if you're here today and you haven't put Jesus at the center of your life yet, I want to encourage you to do so today. Right now. To make that commitment to have Him at the center of your life, your very existence. He is the fulfillment, the embodiment of the living God. He's better than American Express. <laughs> because I tell you, don't leave this world without Him. <clears throat> don't leave home without Him. It is just so very real and, and so very present in the here and now as we look at the world around us and, and all of the chaos and the con confusion and, and all the ungodliness that seems to be just attacking us from every side. More than ever before, I believe that it's time for all of us to get centered in on who Christ Jesus is in our lives. That it truly would, He would change us from the inside out. Because it really is all about Jesus. There's nothing more important. And, and besides, life just makes more sense when Jesus is at the center of everything that you are and who you are, what you are. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Father, once again, what a, a joy it is to, to be in your presence. To give you praise for all that you've done and all that you are to us. Give us that ability, that courage, that confidence, that trust to be able to literally, spiritually climb up in your lap and say, Daddy, I love you. Be with us, Father. Help us to strengthen our walk and to strengthen our faith. Help us to boldly be able to proclaim Jesus in a way that becomes infectious and contagious. That we make a positive input in the lives of people who are searching for you. You are our fulfillment. You are our thankfulness. You are our joy. Help us to live like that. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank <laughs> you.